because we are sensitive to the move of God, we know that He wants to bring our eyes to see more of what's available to us as covenant children. For this, He has prepared a vessel to open us up to His amazing promises, a conveyor of the supernatural healing power, a quintessential minister that is breaking men out from the shackles of evil into the marvelous realm of light. Let's welcome a revealer of kingdom truths, a passionate and unique minister, the co-founder of Terrades Ministries, Carly Terrades. So plot twist, as you can see I'm not Carly Terrades, my name's Ashley Terrades. How many of you know God does not serve dessert first? So you'll get some appetizer and then tomorrow I believe my wife Carly will be ministering. You do not want to miss tomorrow, praise the Lord. Did they make a video of me? I'm just checking, did they, did they make a video of me or not? I don't mind, I can understand this. If there's a video of me, maybe play the video of me for Carly tomorrow. That will really confuse people. <laughs> praise God. Let's give Jesus some praise. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Father God, I thank you for this evening. I thank you, Lord, for this first night of Wine Press 2023. Lord, would you take my words? Holy Spirit, speak through me. Lord, we don't want to hear from Ashley Terrades or Carly Terrades. We want to hear from you, Lord. We want to hear from the Holy Ghost. And I thank you, Lord, I submit myself to you today. We open our hearts up to your word, Lord, to your truths. No distractions. I thank you, Lord. We are listening to you and you alone tonight. In Jesus' name, everyone said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated. You can be seated. Praise the Lord. Isn't this exciting? Man, how many of you, this is your first ever wine press. Your first ever wine press. Praise the Lord. Welcome, welcome, welcome. That's awesome. That is great. We have been longing to come here for three years since Pastor Bladge invited us. Due to restrictions and different things, we were unable to come, but we're so glad we're here in person. Video is okay, but in person is next level, I mean, it's so important. So I want to thank Pastor Bladge and Pastor Mo for having us. We are so blessed, amen. These great leaders, if it wasn't for Pastor Bladge and his leadership, this would not be happening. And all the team as well. There's a massive team that goes behind. Let's give a hand to the team. Praise God. The staff, the volunteers, the team. God is so good. I'm so excited to be here. If you may have noticed, even though I'm from America, I've lived there 15 years. My accent is from England. So you can understand me, right? Praise the Lord. In America, they can't understand me. Any Americans in the house? Uh-oh, I've got to be careful. The Americans say... Ashley, we can't understand you. Do you talk English? I'm like, I talk about English. But anyway, so uh, we've lived in America 15 years and I'm actually bilingual now. I can speak English and American. So you have to pray for me. So I'm so glad that tonight I get to share the word of you real quickly. Tomorrow my wife's going to share. If you didn't know, our daughter Hannah is now 19 or 20 years old. She just turned 20. If you didn't know, uh, 16 years ago in 2003 or 2006 she was diagnosed with an incurable disease in 2006 when she was three years old the doctor said she would not live more than a week I gave her one week to live we brought her to a conference like this we brought her to a conference just like this in England she had hands laid on her and guess what she was instantly miraculously healed what the doctors couldn't do praise God Jesus did right here amen thank you Jesus that was, that was uh, 16 years ago, 17 years ago now, and she is 100% well and healthy, not one thing wrong with her. In fact, she got married and she had a baby just a few weeks ago, praise the Lord. A nice healthy baby boy. Praise God. And then we also have our middle son, Joshua, who's here with us. Josh, stand up and give us a wave. This is our son, Joshua. Amen. He's in full-time ministry. He was just in South Africa ministering down there in Neisner and Johannesburg and doing youth crusades down there. And then our oldest son, Zach, uh, works for our ministry. He runs the administration of our ministry. So we're very blessed to have three children and I guess four now with a son-in-law. Amen. Can I do this? Will you, 
will you all humor me? Will you let me do something which um, is a little crazy? Do you mind? Is that okay? If I get one amen, I'm good. I can, I get one amen. Okay. Okay. Everywhere I go for the first time when it's somewhere new, I like to see your faces when I get home to pray for you and to just celebrate you, praise God. And also put you on Facebook. You could be famous right here, right now. Okay. This could be your moment of fame right here, right now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce you and then I want you to go crazy. Don't, don't stand up, but just we're in your seats. Just wave and shout and things like that. When I give you the cue, is everyone ready? Everyone ready for this? Okay, here we go. So, here we go. This could be your moment on Facebook or Instagram. This could be it. Okay? Shh. Hold. Hold. Hey everyone, I'm here at Wine Press 2023 in Lagos, Nigeria! You did good. You did good, praise <laughs> Maybe our largest, largest, uh, loudest crowd um, that, that said that, you know, we do this in England and in America and places like that, and everyone's very reserved. Oh, jolly good. He's taking a video. Oh, very nice. Hello, oh, darling. Wave, wave. Yes, we're here. I like the energy here in Nigeria, praise God. I like the energy. You guys are serious for the word of God, amen? You guys are serious for the word of God, so I appreciate that so much. Whoa. Is it my time is up already? No? Okay, I'm just checking. Time flies, man. Fun. Thank you so much, sir. I appreciate it. Oh, they gave me some books here. Okay. I would have forgotten to do this. These are our books. We brought some books along with us. In fact, we had them printed right here uh, in uh, Nigeria. So these are, these are our books. This is my wife's book. And um, she can talk a bit more about this tomorrow night. This is her book called Healings, uh, Miracles and Healings Made Easy. And our daughter's testimony is in here. How she was healed of an incurable disease. And also, my wife was healed of grand mal seizure epilepsy, an incurable disease. She was on 13 different medications a day. And um, she was, she couldn't, anyway, she was very incapacitated because of that. And she'll tell you her testimony here as well. If anyone needs a healing or a miracle tonight, this book will really help you, praise God. So, um, who wants to copy this book? Let me give this someone. Who wants to run this book for me? This guy here in the pink shirt, you look like a good runner. Give, give that to someone, sir. Just wave your hands up. That's not for you. That's to give away. Give that to someone. And then one more thing real quickly. This is my book called God Wants You Rich. God Wants You Rich. And this is, I'm going to teach you a little bit on this tonight. This is the scandalous truth. And my good friend, Jesse Duplantis, wrote the foreword. He loved it so much. He said, let me write you the foreword. This book will set you free in finances. So give this to someone. Should I throw it? Give this to someone. You're going to take it or give it away? You give that one away. Come, take a nut, give that away. Give that to someone at the far away there. Oh, look at this. I guess if you get here early and get to the front, you get the free stuff. If you're late at the back there, we love you. We have these available. These are available at our bookstore. I believe there's a table somewhere at the back. You can get those if you want to get yourself a copy. We haven't got that many with us, so be quick. So make sure you get those, praise God. Turn to your Bibles, grab your Bibles, turn to your Bibles. We're going to look at 2 Corinthians tonight. I believe I have a second session on, in, on Friday, so this is going to be more a way of introduction. But I'm excited, I prayed about tonight and I prayed, I spent the day praying in the Holy Ghost for you guys. I said, Lord, what do you want me to share with Wine Press 2023? What do you want me to share with the precious people that have traveled a long way to be here? And he said, tonight, actually, it's not going to be so much teaching. It's going to be more impartation. I believe in impartation. I believe in it. So I'm going to pray for you at the end, and there's going to be an impartation. But you can receive it as I'm talking right now. I'm going to share some truths with you that are really going to bless you and really going to help you. So we're going to have a little bit of impartation tonight. I believe this is, going to be, this is really going to help you. And let me just share a few verses. Don't turn there. But if we were to go to places like 2 Corinthians 5... Uh, 21 okay second Corinthians 5 21 you know this verse is he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us see Jesus became sin on the cross he never sinned amen Jesus was perfect but on that cross he experienced sin God made him sin God put your sin onto Jesus on the cross and why it says here so that we might become the righteousness of God through him think about that church Jesus took your sin, everything you've ever done wrong, everything you should have done you didn't do, everything you ever did wrong, all the shame and the guilt and the condemnation, Jesus took that to the cross 
and you took his righteousness. So right now, as you sit here today, your righteousness is not your own. Your righteousness is Jesus' righteousness. That means you have the righteousness of Christ living on the inside of you. God has given you his righteousness. We could, if you're born again, it only accounts if you're saved. If you're not saved, then you need to fix that right now. Say, Jesus, I make you my Lord, and you can be saved right now. But I'm assuming you're born. If you're born again tonight, these truths are yours. You are righteous. It's the same with healing. You know, in 1 Peter 2.24, it says that Jesus took stripes on his back. He took pain on his back. And he suffered in our place. He suffered in your place. So that by his stripes, we are healed. Amen? These are spiritual truths. When you give your life to Jesus, these are spiritual truths. What happens is, is you take on the life of Jesus. He takes on all the bad things from your life and you get all the good things from his life. It's the almost too good to be true news. That's what the word gospel meant. It meant almost too good to be true news. This is the gospel, ladies and gentlemen. And in Romans 8.37, the apostle Paul puts it this way. In Romans 8.37, he says, In all these things we are more than conquerors. More than conquerors. I always wondered, what's more than a conqueror? I understand what a conqueror is, but what is more than a conqueror? And the Lord showed me, well, imagine two heavyweight boxers. I don't know if you have this in, in Nigeria, but, you know, we have boxing. I don't like it myself. In fact, I had a friend of mine who was an amateur boxer, an amateur fighter. And I said, how do you reconcile this with your faith? He said, well, it's very easy. He said, I just punch him in Jesus' name. <laughs> he said, I give him some fivefold ministry. That's what I do. I'm like, okay. He said, and then I pray for them afterwards for their healing. I said, okay. But anyway, imagine two heavyweight boxers and they fight, right? And eventually one knocks the other one down and one is declared the winner. And they lift up his arms and they say, this is the heavyweight champion of the world. This is the winner, right? And they give him a lot of prize money, millions of dollars prize money. You've probably seen that on te television. They give him a big purse and it could be $50 million worth of prize money. How do you know he's a conqueror? He's, a world, he's the world champion. He's a conqueror. But watch this. His wife, she jumps into the ring and she walks across the canvas, not a mark on her. And she stretches out and kisses him on the cheek. And she takes that $50 million prize money and she goes down to the shops to spend it. Now, he's a conqueror. He won the fight, he's a conqueror. But she's more than a conqueror, amen? Let me tell you this. Through your relationship with Jesus, Jesus is now your husbandman. He was the conqueror. You're more than a conqueror. You're more than a conqueror. You have the righteousness of Christ on the inside of you. You are healed. You have everything you need to do everything God's called you to do. You are more than a conqueror through your relationship with Jesus. So we looked at righteousness, healing. You can apply this to peace of mind, mental strength, peace of mind. What about this area? 2 Corinthians. Everyone find 2 Corinthians? 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, one of my favorite verses right here. It's the same principle. Just like he took your sin and we took his righteousness, just like he took your sickness and disease and pain and we take his healing. Look at this, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. How do you know this is a grace thing? This is not something you can earn. This is not something you've got the right to, that you, you, you can earn and get the right to it. No, you automatically receive this when you give your life to Jesus. Your relationship, that marriage relationship to Jesus automatically gives you these things. This is a grace thing. Grace, I believe Jesus is grace personified. Jesus was the provision of God in our lives. The unmerited favors. This is a grace thing. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, yet though he was rich, hello, Jesus was rich. No, but we see Jesus as just a poor, homeless man. He had nowhere to live. He wore rags, his clothes, and he just wandered around and just about made it through life. This is what religion will teach you. Religion will teach you that Jesus was poor. And we all want to be like Jesus, amen? We just want to be like our Lord and Savior Jesus. So guess what? There's this conflict going on on the inside of us because half of us thinks, well, Pastor Balaji and, and, and my pastors, they tell me that God wants me to prosper financially. But over here, I see Jesus as someone who is poor on earth. He had no money and I want to be just like Jesus. And you have this inner turmoil. You think one hand you want to want wealth and the other hand you want to be just like Jesus. I've got news for you. Jesus was rich on earth. Jesus had money on earth. When Jesus was on earth, he had money. It says right here he was rich. He traveled. You couldn't travel in those days unless you had finances. He had a band of men following him around. 
In fact, if you try and travel with 12 teenagers, that's expensive. He had a band of men following him around. He rode a brand new donkey, an unridden colt. He had a brand new vehicle. His clothes were so nice that they fought over his clothes. When he died on the cross, they, they didn't want to rip his clothes. They said, his clothes are so nice. They're made with one scene. They're like designer clothes. We're, we're going to keep these in one place. He did have a house. There's more scriptures to say that he had a house. He had a ministry headquarters in Capernaum. It was a, it was a ministry headquarters. It was his own house. It's where they lowered the, the person through the roof. You might say, well, he had a treasurer. Why would you have a treasurer if you had no money? Let me ask this. And if you had a treasurer who is stealing from you, you better have a little bit of money if that treasurer is stealing from you for three years and you don't even notice it. It said he had people following him around, ministering to him daily. Wealthy men sought him out when he was born and gave him gold, very precious gold, frankincense and myrrh. They gave him expensive gifts. No, Jesus had money while he was on earth. You might say, Rashley, he says he didn't even have money to buy a tomb. He had to be laid in a borrowed tomb when he died. I don't think that was lack of money. I just think that was good stewardship. Because if you're only going to use a grave, if you're only going to use a tomb for three days, why buy it? You can't rent a tomb, right? You can't like VRBO, Airbnb, a tomb. You have to buy. So he just borrowed a tomb. Now, let me tell you, Jesus had money while he was on earth. But here's the thing. It says right here, though he was rich for our sakes, for your sakes, for your sakes, guess what he did? He became poor. Jesus became poor for our sakes. And he did this. He said he became poor. Why? So that us through his poverty might be made rich. I'm here to tell you, church, Jesus had money while he was on earth. But here's the truth. When he went to that cross, he died poor on the cross. Just like he died experiencing the effects of sin, the guilt and shame. Just like he died with the effects of pain and suffering in his body. And just like he died of anxiety and, and no peace in his mind. He died poor on the cross. They did a study, what is the worst poverty you can experience in the world? What's the worst poverty you can experience in the world? You know, they said the most extreme poverty a human being can experience is being thirsty and naked. If, you complete, if you're th so thirsty you can't drink and you're naked, that's the worst poverty a man can experience. How did Jesus die on the cross? He died thirsty and naked. I'm here to tell you, church, Jesus experienced extreme poverty so that we wouldn't have to. And I'm here to tell you, this is a financial verse. It's right in the middle of a financial scripture. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 2 Corinthians chapter 9 is talking all about finances. If you take a text out of context, don't take this text out of context and say, Brother Ashley, Brother Ashley, that's just talking about spiritually rich. Well, sure, we're spiritually rich. But the Apostle Paul right here is talking about money. Don't take that text out of context. If you take a text out of context, what are you left with? A con. The truth is, Jesus became poor. He, the maker of heaven and earth, the one who experienced heaven, became poor for our sakes. He took on poverty and experienced that extreme poverty so we wouldn't have to. And I'm here to tell you, church, I hate poverty. And if there's no other reason why I hate it, I hate lack, I hate poverty, is because Jesus paid for it. If Jesus paid for something, who are we to reject it? Jesus bought us a gift. Jesus paid for a gift. And if we say, no, I don't want that. See, here's what happens. We fall into one of two ditches. We either say, I don't want anything to do with that prosperity message. That's all about greed and about getting my own stuff. And I don't want to be one of these greedy American TV evangelists. I get accused of that. They say, I'm an American prosperity teacher. And then I start preaching. They say, oh, he's not American. It confuses them. It's quite, I'm like stealthy. But on one hand, we don't want to be like that. On the other hand, so what we do is we say, on the other hand, we see it. We just don't want anything to do with it. Just give me enough, Lord, for me. If you believe in God just for your needs to be met, then you're selfish. If you are believing to just have your needs met, I just want enough money, Lord, to pay my rent, my mortgage. I just want enough money to feed my kids. Then you're selfish. And I'll tell you why. If that word rich bothers you, let's look at God's definition of rich. What does God mean when he means rich? See, here's the thing. This gospel works in anywhere. It works in any continent, in any country, in any town. This, con this, 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 this will work in any place for anyone, education or not, any, whatever... Wherever you was born, however you grew up, this works. 
This works first out. I know people that were, that were born in extreme poverty and had to sleep on the dirt floor every night. And now they're, they're very, very wealthy. Multiple houses, multiple properties, businesses, big givers. This works. I've seen this work in prison cells. I've seen this work on the continent of Africa. I've seen this work in the continent of Asia. I've seen this work in Central America. I've seen this work around the world. I've seen this work with single mothers. I've seen this work with widows. I've seen this work with uneducated people, with educated people. See, the gospel works. The word of God works and God wants you to prosper tonight. God wants you prosperous financially and it's not a bad thing. Religion will tell you it's a bad thing. But here's the thing, the devil is sneaky. The enemy just wants to keep you sick and poor. If he can keep you sick and poor, he can keep you out of the will of God. How many of you know, if you've got sickness in your body, if you're sick in your body, if you've got ailments that you can't do certain things, you're limited in your choices. You're limited on where you can go, how many people you can help, you're limited. And it's the same if you, if you experience poverty. If you have lack in your life, how are you going to help people? How are you going to travel and, and minister? How are you going to be able to help your neighbours? How are you going to be able to pay for people's food? How are you going to be able to sponsor children? How are you going to be able to do these things if you can't even pay for your own way? Now this is no condemnation, but I'm telling you, God has got a better life for us. John 10.10 John 10 says the thief comes to kill, steal and destroy. But guess what? I have come. Jesus came that you may have life and life more abundantly. God wants you to live the abundant life. God wants you to live a life that's so abundant that there'll be an overflow in every area of your life. An overflow of energy, an overflow of ministry, an overflow of finances that you can give away and spread the kingdom of God. See, God's definition of being rich is a little bit different from the world's definition of being rich. In fact, most things in the kingdom of God are upside down. The world is upside down. The kingdom of God is the right way around. But let's look, let's turn over one chapter and I'll show you. Pastor Baladji read this this morning at the leaders meeting. Turn over one chapter to, to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. And we'll look at God's definition of what rich is or God's definition of prosperity. See, we have to understand what the purpose of being prosperous is. We have to understand what the purpose of being rich is. If we don't understand what the purpose of it is, we'll either abuse it or neglect it. If you don't understand what the purpose of something is, you'll either abuse it or neglect it. I heard a story many years ago about a lady when iPads first came out. You know, the, the Apple iPads, right? Who loves iPads? I, love, I use my iPad all the time. So she, she bought her elderly father an Apple iPad so he could FaceTime with her and text message her and everything else. And he bought it for her and he sent, she sent it ahead. And when she saw him a few months later, she said, Dad, how'd you like the Apple iPad? He said, I love it. He said, I use it every day. And he went in the kitchen, he started chopping carrots and potatoes on it. Started washing it in the sink. He thought it was a chopping board, a cutting board. He didn't know what it was. He never even turned it on. If you don't understand the purpose of something, you're going to abuse it or not use it right. God's purpose for prosperity is not what we think it is. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, another financial verse right here, says this. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. God is able to make all grace abound towards you. You know, this is a grace thing again. God is able. Anytime you hear that God is able, that means we have a part to play in this. See, grace has already paid for everything. But we have to respond to God's grace by faith. God's grace has covered it. God's grace has given you your healing. God's grace has given you peace. God's grace has given you everything you need. But we have a responsibility to respond to his grace by faith. It's our response to God is by faith. So God is able. The question is, are you going to let him? Are you going to be willing? God is able. Are you going to be willing? It says God is able to make all grace abound towards you. That you always have in all sufficiency in all things. God wants you to have all your needs met all the time. All sufficiency in all things, meaning all your needs met all the time. God is a good father. And he looks after his kids. Maybe you've had a good father, bad father, no father. God is a perfect father. You could find the best father on the planet right now. You could find the best parent on the planet. Someone who's just an amazing parent, never gets angry at their kids. Just amazing parent. And yet, compared to God, Jesus said they're evil. That's how good God is. God is the perfect father. And let me tell you, God looks after his children. God supplies for his children. God provides. And right here it says that God is able to make all grace abound towards you, having all sufficiency in all things, all your needs met all the time. But if it stopped there, 
it would sound selfish because it's just about us. But it doesn't stop there. He goes on. And this is the purpose of prosperity right here. That you may have an abundance. Everyone say abundance. Abundance. You seem a little shy about abundance. Abundance. You are able to have abundance for all, for every good work. Every time you see a good work, every time you see someone in need, every time you hear about a church, every time you hear about a, a missionary, every time you hear about someone in need, benevolently, you can give to your church, give to missionaries, give to ministries. Give, it's, it costs money to get the gospel out. It costs money to get the gospel out. It costs money to have a conference like Wine Press. I don't know, upset anyone, but this cost a lot of money to put this on. It was free to you, but it was not free to Harvesters International Christian Centre. This costs money to put on. It costs money to get the gospel out. We're on television all around Africa, around the world actually. Daystar, TBN, Faith TV, all these different networks. It costs money to go on the networks. It costs money for us to fly here. We couldn't go to a Delta Airlines and give them a hug. They want to see money. I'm going to go there and say, don't worry, I'm prosperous on the inside. Give me the ticket. No, they want to see the money. They want to see the manifestation of that prosperity. It costs money to get the gospel out. And that's why, church, it's important right now more than ever. In fact, I believe it's a mandate from God that we should prosper his way. The church of Jesus Christ needs to prosper in these times. There's a wealth transfer happening right now. And we need to be tuned into the spirit of God so we can prosper God's way. Don't listen to religion that will tell you, oh, it's greedy to prosper. No, if you're greedy already... You'll just be more greedy when you have more money. I happen to believe most people have the nature of God on the inside of them. When they're born again, you take on the nature of God. And have you know, God is a giver. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. God's very nature is a giver. He's not a taker. Therefore, the more money you have, the more you're going to reflect God. And you're going to be able to give more and be a greater giver. God wants you to prosper financially. He wants you to prosper. There's wealth transfer happening. Nigeria is getting wealthy. You notice things are changing in Nigeria. And this prosperity is meant to be in the hands of the believers. Why should this prosperity be in the hands of the unbelievers? Pushing their things that aren't godly. The wealth should be in the hands of the believers so we can advance the kingdom of God and help more people. You've heard of the golden rule, right? The golden rule is whoever has all the gold makes the rules. Therefore, if the body of Christ, if the church has the money, we can actually influence nations for good. We can influence nations for good, and that's the purpose of prosperity. It gives us influence, we can help people, we can advance the kingdom. Deuteronomy 8.18, turn there, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18. Deuteronomy 8.18. The Lord says this in Deuteronomy 8.18. He says, do not forget the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth. As I was praying today, the Lord said, tell people to stop praying for wealth. Many of us pray for wealth. Many of us pray for prosperity. Many of us pray for money. Oh, Lord, give me money. Oh, Lord, I just need some money. Give me money. Give me prosperity. Oh, Lord, make me rich. The Lord told me to tell you today, stop praying for prosperity. Stop praying for money. It's gone quiet. You know why? Because God's given us the ability. Read this verse. He's given you the ability to get wealth. When you gave your life to Jesus, he gave you the ability to get wealth. He gave you the ability to make money. He gave you the ability to accumulate wealth. He prospered you on the inside. You're already rich on the inside. Spiritually speaking, you are prosperous. And one of the problems is, is you approach it as saying, well, I'm poor at the moment. I've got no money. I can't give. I haven't got enough to pay my bills. I hopefully, you know, one day I might become prosperous. That's the wrong starting place. The starting place is you are more than conqueror. You're already prosperous in your spirit. The question is, are you going to believe it and see it manifest in your world? See it manifest out of your soul and start seeing it translate into business deals, into promotions, into new things happening and start seeing that money translate into prosperity. God has promises for you. He has places for you to go, people for you to meet, things for you to change. And it's going to require money. It's going to require prosperity. So tonight, I want some of you to break off this religious attitude. Break off this fear of being prosperous. I want to tell you, it's going to be okay. I've been poor and I've been rich, and rich is better. You can do more. I'm telling you, when we first got married, me and Kylie had no money. We had no heating in England, no heat. 
tiny little house we rented. There was wildlife, rodents in the kitchen. We had, we had no money. We couldn't afford to buy coffee or cereal. I had to go to the store. I had enough money. I could either buy coffee or I could buy cereal. That's a big decision. Are you going to be tired and hungry or hungry and tired? That's like, but you know what we did? We started to believe the word of God. 20 years old, we started to believe the word of God. We said, God, you know what? Your word is no respecter of persons. Your word works. We started following the principles of the word of God. And guess what happened? God started to prosper us. It wasn't overnight. These things don't usually happen overnight. It can. You can have overnight breakthrough. I'm going to pray tonight for overnight breakthrough for you. But a lot of the time, these things are precept upon precept, layer upon layer. And you start moving in the right direction by faith. And as you move in the right direction by faith, God will give you breakthroughs. On your way, you'll get breakthroughs. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be praying for you in a minute. I believe many of you are going to have supernatural working of miracles in the area of finances. Supernatural working of miracles in the area of your businesses. I'm telling you. I've seen it too many times myself personally. I've seen this too many times. We had a house in England. We lived in America. I, had to, uh, I was renting the house out. And the, the renters, I, I said, I can't keep renting this house out. The mortgage wasn't working. I was a permanent resident in America. The taxes were getting confusing. I said, I'm, I need to do something in this house. I prayed in the Holy Ghost. I said, Lord, what should I do? And he said, put people first. You always put people before money. Amen. People, people are true riches. Money's, money comes and goes, but people are more important. He said, put the people first. So don't, don't sell the house and kick the people out. So I went to the, the tenants. I went to the renters. I said, would you like to buy this house? I thought, surely they want to buy this house. I said, I'll give you payments towards this house. I'll give you the down payment. I'll help you. And they said, we don't want to own the house. They'd never owned a house. They had this poverty spirit, this poverty mindset in their 50s and never owned property. I'm here to tell you, some of you are going to own property for the first time. Some of you need to stop just renting. No condemnation. There's nothing wrong with this. Sometimes it's good to rent in certain situations. But ultimately, God wants you to own property. God wants you to own your house. God wants you to own your vehicle. God wants you to own things. He wants to make you owners and not renters. So they didn't want to own the house. So I said, Lord, what do I do? I prayed in the Holy Ghost. Have you know, you pray in the Holy Ghost. God will give you supernatural insights. He'll give you wisdom. I prayed in the Holy Ghost. And the Lord told me to see a man, a friend of mine, in Denver, Colorado. So I went to see him. I actually had a conference with him. About two months later, I went to see him. And when I got there, I said, his name is Dan. I said, Dan... I said, I've got this situation. Now, he's a real estate, he's a housing expert. He's a real estate expert, owns many homes. So I wrote out all the figures. I said, here's the deal. This is how much the mortgage is. This is how much the rent is. This is how much the, you know, the taxes are. And I laid it all out. I said, what do I do, Dan? What do I do? And he looked at it and he scratched his head. He said, I've got nothing. On the inside, I was like, you kidding me? The Holy Spirit has told me you've got my answer. You better think again. And he was like, I've got nothing. On the outside, I was like, no problem, Dan. It's no problem. And I went to my hotel room disappointed that night. But have you know, when the Holy Ghost gives you an answer, you lean on the answer and you put a demand on the answer. And I said, Lord, you told me to see this man. I thank you, Lord, that Dan has my answer. I didn't go and say, well, that didn't work. Prayer didn't work. That praying didn't work. I must have missed it. No, I started saying, Lord, I thank you that brother Dan has my answer. And I put a demand on the answer. The next morning I see him at breakfast. He runs over to me, he grabs my hand. He said, I want you to meet someone. We're in Denver, Colorado, America. My house is in England, 5,000 miles away, different continent. He said, I went to meet someone, and he introduced me to this little English lady. Her prayer was this. She had an inheritance come in. She said, Lord, I want to buy a house, and I want to be a landlord, but I don't want to rehab a house. I don't want to fix a house up. I don't want to look for a house. I want the house to come to me. I want tenants to be in there. I want renters to be in there already, and I want to spend this amount of money. She told me how much money she wanted to spend. It was exactly what I was selling the house for. Listen, she, God flew her 5,000 miles around the world to a conference she'd never been to before to do a deal with me. And on that one deal, I took that money and I paid off my house in America and could become completely debt-free. Don't tell me God can't do supernatural work into miracles. The Holy Ghost has answers for you. The Holy Ghost is not just for healing and for, and for meetings. The Holy Ghost is for business. Jesus went to the marketplace and found his disciples. Let me tell you, Jesus was a businessman. God loves business. In Proverbs, it says, God delights in business done right. God loves business. God loves business done right. It reflects him. In fact, the word worship and, and work in the Hebrew is the same word. Look it up for yourselves. The word worship and work is the same word, meaning this. Jewish people believe when they go to work, it's a form of worship to God. 
When you go to work and work as unto the Lord, it's worship towards the Lord. When you run your business, when you go and honour your boss, honour your manager, when you go and do things right, it's worship to the Lord. Colossians 3 verses 17 and 23 says, Whatever you do in work or deed, do it as unto the Lord. We need to worship the Lord in our businesses. We need to put our businesses under God's authority. You see, Peter had a boat, a fishing boat, and he didn't catch anything. He had a bad day's fishing. He was out there fishing, couldn't catch anything. And then Jesus got in his boat. Jesus said, can I enter your boat? And, the, and, and Peter said, yeah, come on into my boat. We need to invite Jesus into our businesses. We need to invite Jesus into our finances. We need to invite Jesus into our bank accounts. Jesus into our workplace. And Jesus got in that boat. He spread the gospel from that boat. He preached. And he said to Peter, let down your net on the other side. And guess what happens? Peter did something very natural, unspectacular. He just let his net down. Just like he'd been doing all night. The difference was he did it under God's command. He let it down on the other side. Just a little tweak. He heard the voice of God. Let down your nets on the other side. And guess what happened? Supernatural catch of fish so big it almost began to sink his boat. He had to call his partners. He had so much wealth, he had to have other people come and help him reap the harvest. How do you know God wants you to have business that's so profitable, so prosperous, that's making so much money, you're going to have to share the wealth with people around you. You're going to start hiring people and giving them jobs to people that haven't got jobs. You're going to be able to start giving it to people and making people contractors, making people associates and, and partners in your business because your business is bringing in so much money. Who wants to believe this tonight? Because it's the truth. I'm telling you, this is the truth. God wants you to prosper tonight. God's got new ways for you to make money. He's given you the power to get wealth. He's given you this power. You know, in Proverbs 10, 22, in Proverbs 10, 22, it says, the blessing of the Lord makes one rich. The blessing of the Lord makes one rich. And he adds no sorrow to it. The blessing of the Lord makes one rich. How do you know God's blessing on your life will make you rich if you let it? The only person that can stop the will of God, the only person that can stop the promises of God being fulfilled in your life is the person you look at in the mirror. It's you. No one else can stop the will of God happening in your life. No devil in hell, not your family, not your neighbor, not your boss. No one can stop God's promises in your life except you. If you choose to believe the word of God, if you renew your mind to the word of God, if you start seeing yourself prosperous and start saying, Lord, I thank you that I'm rich. I thank you, Lord, you paid the price for me to be rich. I'm going to receive that gift. I thank you, Lord, the blessing of the Lord makes one rich and I'm blessed. I thank you, Lord, I'm blessed with an everlasting blessing. I thank you, Lord, I'm blessed with believing Abraham. Have you know, Abraham was very wealthy. His son was very wealthy. His grandson was very wealthy. And it says the Gentiles envied him. How many of you lately have non-Christians, how many of you lately have non-Christians come to you because they're jealous of your prosperity? This should be the normal Christian life. See, there's no lack with God. There's no lack with God. It's a lie. There's no lack of resources. There's no lack of money. There is more than enough for everybody in Nigeria to be multimillionaires, billionaires. Multi there's more than enough. There's more than enough resources. There's more than enough opportunities. The problem is we walk around and say, well, I never get a lucky break. I'm not like one of those rich people. It's never going to work out for me. That's okay for Brother Ashley. He's English. He lives in America. That's okay for Pastor Bladger. He has this, that, never. It's not going to work for me. And guess what happens? You're going to have exactly what you believe for. You're going to have exactly what you believe for. Or you can change your way of thinking. How can two walk together unless they agree? Amos 3.3. And God's opinion of you is that he's given you the power to get wealth. We better start exercising this church. God needs you to start getting wealthy. God needs you so he can spread this gospel. So he can, why did he give you the power to get wealth? Deuteronomy 8.18. Deuteronomy 8.18. So he can establish his covenant. This isn't about us. This is about God establishing his covenant. And he wants to use people like you and me. Doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are. Doesn't matter how educated you are or not, this will work for anybody, anywhere, if you work it. This will work if you work it. God has given you this power. And I happen to believe I'd rather let God be true and every man a liar. So everyone with an excuse that says, I can't become wealthy. What does the word say? Yes, you can. God's given you the provision to do it. God's given you a way to do it. In Proverbs, I believe it's 13.4. Proverbs 10.22 says, the blessing of the Lord makes one rich. And he has no sorrow to it. Proverbs 13.4 says the diligent soul will be made rich. 
There's a diligence to this. It's going to take some diligence. This word rich here used in Proverbs is talking about tangible money, wealth. Every time it's used, it's talking about tangible money, wealth. There's some diligence. You're going to have to be diligent to believe this. You're going to have to be diligent to put your hand to something. God has blessed the works of your hands. But if you're not giving God anything to work with, a hundredfold of nothing is nothing. A hundredfold of zero is zero. We have to give God something to work with. We can't just sit and pray for prosperity. Like I said, the Lord told me to tell you tonight, stop praying for prosperity and start thanking God for what you already have. Start thanking God that he's made you prosperous. Start thanking God that you're blessed. Start thanking God that you've already, you've already got what you need and go out there and put your hand to something. Deuteronomy 28.8, Deuteronomy 28.8 says he blesses the works of your hands. How do you get up every morning? You need to be getting up every morning and saying, Lord, I thank you that the works of my hands are blessed. I may have a seemingly small job that makes a seemingly small amount of money, but how do you know my hands are blessed? See, Jesus was in the middle of nowhere. It says the hour was late and the place was desolate. He was in a bad place. The hour was late and the, and the place was desolate. And all they had was five loaves and two fish. That was it. Five loaves, two fish, and 5,000 men to feed. Imagine this scenario. 5,000 hungry men, and all he's got is five loaves and two fish. How do you know that looks like not enough? Maybe your business looks like not enough. Maybe your job looks like not enough. Maybe what you have in your hand right now looks like not enough. Maybe your bank account looks like it's not enough. But what did Jesus do? He took those five loaves and two fish, and he didn't complain. He didn't make excuses. He didn't say this isn't enough. He didn't say, What's this good? what good is this? He didn't say, Are you kidding me? Five loaves and two fish? There's 5,000 men here. He didn't eat them loaves and fish himself. Think about this, the disciples were hungry too. They could have eaten those loaves and fish and had themselves a little snack, sustained them. They could have eaten their seed. Now what did Jesus do? He took those loaves and fish. He looked up to heaven. It says he looked up. That, that word, if you study it out, that phrase looked up means he looked into the spirit realm. He looked beyond the natural. Some of us need to look beyond the natural tonight. You need to look beyond the natural circumstances. Jesus looked beyond the natural circumstances. And what he saw was a loving father who looks after his children. He looked beyond the natural circumstances and he blessed those loaves and fish. He said, thank you, Lord, for these loaves and fish. He blessed them and then he broke them. Then he put some management in place. He put order in place. He said, have them sit down in groups of 50. God will give you a specific plan in business. He will show you what to do, how to do it, who to use, who not to use. He will show you. God is the God of order. How many times we think God is just, God is so out there. He doesn't want to get involved in your business. He doesn't want to get involved in your job. He's just out there. Now, how do you know God wants to get involved with your job? God wants to get involved with your job and he wants to, he wants to bless you and give you more than enough. Praise God. He wants to give you more than enough. Okay. I'm going to wrap it up. Stand up. I want to pray for you. Stand up right now. I'm going to pray for you. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, right now, Lord. Your word for us, your will for us is that we are blessed and not cursed. I thank you, Lord, that we are blessed. I thank you, Lord, that we are blessed with believing Abraham. I thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord, we thank you right now that you experienced poverty on the cross. That you went to that cross, experienced that poverty, so we won't have to. And right now, I curse lack in this building in Jesus' name. I curse lack in this building. I curse poverty in this building. I say no more lack, no more poverty in Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord, for abundance. I thank you, Lord, for more than enough. I thank you, Lord, your grace is sufficient. I thank you, Lord, for people doing business supernaturally in Jesus' name. I thank you for the working of miracles on people's businesses. I thank you for witty inventions, new ideas. I thank you for new things coming out. I thank you for new solutions. I thank you for people adding value to the workplace. I thank you that people are being promoted today. People are being promoted. I thank you for new opportunities, new contracts, new business ideas. I thank you for supernatural debt release right now in Jesus' name. Supernatural debt release. Some of you are in debt and it wasn't even your fault. We release that debt in Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord. We release that in Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord. We're going to start seeing ourselves minds renewed. We're going to start seeing ourselves prosperous. I thank you, Lord. We are seeing ourselves prosperous and we are making a difference in our world. I thank you, Lord, for the supernatural working of miracles over people's businesses right now. Transactional miracles in Jesus' name. Promotions. Hallelujah. New clientele. Thank you, Lord. New ways of doing things. Inventions. Patterns. People are inventing things and people are going to pay millions for your ideas 
intellectual property. People are going to have new intellectual property. And people are going to buy people from America and are going to pay for your intellectual property. In Jesus' name, I thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, thank you that you've supplied all our needs according to your riches. I thank you we don't live on the, the Logos uh, economy, the Nigerian economy, the African economy. We don't live on the economy of this world. I thank you we live on heaven's economy. In Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you you've made us rich. In Jesus' name. Receive that in Jesus' name. Receive the riches of God. In Jesus' name. Let's give Jesus some praise. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Woo. Praise God. I'm excited. I believe I'll be back Friday. We're going to finish this off Friday. We're going to, we're going to look into some more practical things Friday. My wife, Carla, is going to be here uh, tomorrow, I believe. Tomorrow night. Bring out anyone who's sick. Anyone needs a healing. Tomorrow night, Carla's going to be praying for the sick. Praise God. So let's give Jesus another hand. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus.